West Asia war spirals. Iran rains missiles. Israel vows retaliation. Khamenei leads Friday prayers for the first time in five years. Calls October 7th and missile strike legal. Islamic nations and Islamic countries. Israel bombs Beirut, invades Lebanon. Nasrallah's successor targeted. Netanyahu goes for the kill. What role will America play? West Asia Roundtable. Hello and welcome. Is the world heading for a spiraling conflict that could impact it well beyond West Asia? That's the big question that's been dominating the global discourse this week. Ever since Iran targeted Israel with a major ballistic missile strike. Iran now, Israel now launches an all-out offensive against the Hezbollah in Lebanon, killing more and more of the Hezbollah's leadership. The United Nations seems powerless at the moment and the US unwilling, it appears, to stop the war. Today, we will have a very special roundtable that looks at all the issues concerning the conflict in West Asia and beyond. Joining us on the roundtable, Jeremy Isharshaw. He's former Vice Director General, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and former Head of the Multi Affairs Directorate in Israel. Sari Hanifi, who I spoke to earlier, is Director at the American University in Beirut. Lahib Higal is Senior Iraq Analyst. Andrew Latham is Professor McAllister College. And KC Singh is former Secretary MEA who served in the West Asian region. Thank you all very much for joining me. I will raise several big questions on the round table. The questions tonight. How will Israel retaliate? How far will Israel and Iran now go for an eyeball to eyeball conflict? Will the war drag in other nations? What role will the United States now play? And what is the end game for this conflict? Before we come into the questions, I want to play out what Khamenei, Iran's supreme leader, said today in a rare appearance in Friday prayers mourning the death of Hassan Nasrallah and what Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli prime minister, had to say. Listen in to the two principal actors in what threatens to be a globally escalating conflict. The move taken by our armed forces was the least punishment for the occupying Zionist regime in the face of the crimes, the unbelievable crimes committed by that regime, uh, the bloodthirsty regime, the wolfish regime. This, we neither hesitate, we will not give up and but we will not rush at the same time there is nowhere in the Middle East Israel cannot reach there is nowhere we will not go to protect our people and protect our country with every passing moment the regime is bringing you the noble Persian people closer to the abyss but you know one simple thing Iran's tyrants don't care about your future but you do when Iran is finally free, and that moment will come a lot sooner than people think, everything will be different. Our two ancient peoples, the Jewish people and the Persian people, will finally be at peace. Our two countries, Israel and Iran, will be at peace. I'm going to come to each of my guests in a moment, but I want to first turn to Sari Hanafi. He's Director, Center for Arab and Middle Eastern Studies, American University of Beirut. I turn to him because Beirut has become the epicenter of the latest conflict that Israel is waging at the moment against Hezbollah. More bombings today, more reports of potentially even the successor of Hassan Nasrallah having been assassinated. Mr. Uh, uh, Hanafi, the fact is 
Israel conducting a series of strikes on what they are calling the Hezbollah's southern Beirut strongholds. There are reports that Israeli drones have dropped bombs in Beirut. Can you give us a sense of what is the situation on the ground where you are? Thank you for your, your question. Just I will uh, fix some of the vocabulary. Um, what has been uh, done uh, in the last two weeks is, uh, is, uh, is a rather a genocidal war uh, against Lebanon. So it's, it's not uh, targeting uh, Hezbollah uh, stronghold only. It's really uh, uh, killing so much civilians. I should uh, um, bring this example in Saida uh, last week in order to kill one Hezbollah uh, leader, and it's not important leader, just a local leader in Saida. This is a second city of Lebanon. They killed 72 civilians and injured 102 civilians. So you see this is really, it's not striking against Hezbollah. It's a, it's a, a indiscriminate attack between uh, combatant and non-combatant. The situation in the last two weeks, uh, we have hundred, uh, sorry, 1,972, according to the Lebanese Ministry of, of, of Health, uh, uh, killed mm -hmm. and around uh, 5,000 injured. So it's really, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a scale of uh, massacres, and I would say they are uh, the Israeli is going to do the same thing what they did in Gaza is uh, r raising uh, the whole uh, strip, Gaza strip, and they are ready to do it here. You know, you're expressing the fear that Israel could be doing to Lebanese cities what you claim they've done to Gaza already. Israel is issuing alerts to citizens to evacuate from southern Lebanon. They are saying Hezbollah is using citizens as human shields for protection. How are people then reacting to these alerts from, from Israel? Yeah, you, you know, uh, let's us also refresh our memory what happened in Gaza. So uh, they, they ask people to move from place to place and then they bombard them in the other place. So this is what is going on also in Lebanon. So yes, they, they asked to evacuate almost uh, 45 uh, localities. Uh, uh, in the south, and many, many, uh, 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 if you like, the whole mm -hmm. quarter of the of Dahia, which is a suburb of uh, the southern suburb of Beirut. Uh, it's really is a huge scale. This is why uh, in Lebanon today, you have million and 200,000 displaced. It means that the quarter of the population are uh, uh, today displaced in, in Lebanon. But what, what is the public mood towards Hezbollah? Because there are sections of Lebanese society who have long felt Hezbollah has hijacked the Lebanese state through its military stand. Do they want to avoid this escalation? Are the people expressing really support for Hezbollah at all? Yeah, I mean, Lebanese society is, uh, uh, is divided society, exactly like India, like UK, like France, is a divided society. Those, they're... they're there are some who are uh, for uh, for justice because we uh, we should remember that according to the international community, uh, uh, Palestinian territories, West Bank and Gaza, is illegally occupied. So uh, society divided between those who are in favor of an ethical engagement uh, against the uh, settler colonial and apartheid regime in Israel and those who are against. So yes, in this meaning, uh, it is divided society. You're saying it's a divided society. It's a good point on which I want to bring in Jeremy Ishashop because uh, an Israeli perspective seems to suggest that Hezbollah is a terrorist group that needs to be eliminated. You've got voices in Lebanon saying the mood on the ground is much more divided. And of course, the fears that civilians are losing their lives as Israel prosecutes the war, first in Gaza, now in Lebanon. Your response, is Israel in a way now determined to take this to a finality? And if so, what is that? Israel is determined uh, to defend its national security. And you mentioned just before the supreme, so-called supreme leader of Iran, Khamenei, 
who addressed uh, his nation and praised the October 7th massacre by Hamas of Israeli civilians, men, women, children, babies, burned, raped, massacred. Uh, and this was praised by the leader of a so-called civilized country that actually has been backing uh, Hezbollah, who immediately after October 7th attacked Israel with hundreds of rockets. Since then, they've displaced uh, over th tens of thousands of Israeli citizens from the northern uh, city. They're a terrorist organization, Hezbollah, that, is, uh, that has hijacked the whole of Lebanon. And I'm surprised that Mr. Hanafi uh, neglected to mention how his whole uh, country, Lebanon, has been undermined by Hezbollah, by this terrorist organization, which has uh, stored up thousands and hundreds of thousands of missiles uh, in civilian areas, in civilian villages in the south. Uh, and they expect Israel just to accept 100 rockets, 300 rockets a day. Uh, without having any response. I can't imagine what India would do if any one of their neighbors was shelling uh, uh, them with uh, their territory with uh, hundreds of rockets a day. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that uh, I think it's time to get real and time to understand that this terrorism has to end. Um, and the war in Gaza, it was uh, the Iranian foreign minister visited Beirut today and said that the war in uh, Lebanon will only cease once the war in Gaza should end. Um, and so I think that it's about time that, you know, look, Israel will have to respond to the attack by Iran of 181 into, uh, ballistic missiles that were launched against Israel uh, two or three nights ago. And it's uh, something that cannot be left unanswered. So you're not looking for escalation, but we can not tolerate the fact that so many ballistic missiles were targeted on Israel by Iran for no reason whatsoever. So you're very clear. Let me get this very clear. You're very clear that Israel's uh, that Iran's act of the uh, ballistic missiles was provocative. You're very clear that Khamenei's speech, which you believe defended what happened on October 7th with ha uh, Hamas is provocative. And therefore, you see a certain inevitability of Israel escalating this conflict with Iran. Am I clear? I, I would say it in a different way. Israel will in all likelihood respond to the brazen attack of 181 ballistic missiles fired against our civilian cities and uh, uh, other installations. So yes, there will be a response. Uh, uh, will there be an escalation? Will depend on how far Iran wants to take this and Iran has been escalating this conflict. Let's not forget mm -hmm. since October 7th and even before then, we've also had attacks from the Houthis uh, in Yemen who are financed by Iran. Uh, we've also had attack uh, which killed two soldiers in Israel today from Iraq. Again, uh, militias financed and pushed by Iran. So yes, Israel is going to respond to this uh, in a very, uh, I hope, decisive way. Are we going to escalate? That remains to be seen, but we will defend our national security. Okay, those are strong words. Andrew Latham, Professor of International Relations and Political Theory uh, at McAllister College, United States. is You're listening to these voices coming in both from the Arab world as well as uh, from Israel. Is the United States unwilling or powerless to really stop this conflict from escalating in your view? Uh, yes, the short answer to the question is yes. Uh, this current administration is not really in a position to exercise uh, much influence on uh, the Israeli government's response, with one exception. I think drawing a red line around a retaliatory, not preemptive, retaliatory response that includes uh, Iranian nuclear facilities, I think that's off the table. There are basically two schools of thought in Israel and, and in the U.S. when it comes to what Israel should do to respond to uh, this uh, 181 ballistic missiles being fired, one of which is tit for tat, respond in kind. Nominally, at least, those missiles were targeted at military facilities. Um, they, did, they weren't very effective. In fact, they were incredibly ineffective. Um, and so Israel might respond by attacking military facilities in Iran. Mm -hmm. 
uh, they would be much more effective. Uh, the, the Iranian Air Force and air defense capabilities are so limited as to be laughable. Israel has entire air supremacy and could do whatever it wants. That's the minimal response. The maximal response, which is a little more frightening and has a great deal of support in Israel and in the Republican Party in the United States, is that, th that Israel should go way beyond that. Israel should, in fact, even if you take the nuclear facilities off the table, 83% uh, of the revenues that the Tehran government uh, spends on domestic things, but also supporting its proxies in the region, are derived from oil. And oil is exported primarily through two ports. And Israel has demonstrated the ability, because it attacked the Houthi port, um, an ability to strike long range. Mm -hmm. Israel could shut down the Iranian economy tomorrow and fracture what is already a very fragile regime. And in so doing, would cripple uh, the Houthis, uh, Iran's proxies in Syria and Iraq. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't need to worry about Hamas anymore. That's already been uh, the military arm destroyed anyway. And Hezbollah is next, is about to be destroyed, military arm anyway. Um, now, what that would mean if Israel were to do that, that would probably accelerate the Tehran regime's uh, pursuit of nuclear weapons. It's only about six weeks away from having uh, demonstrated a nuclear capability, then it has to weaponize and whatnot. Um, so it, it really, uh, and when I'm reading the tea leaves and listening to Prime Minister Netanyahu, mm -hmm. I'm beginning to think that it's the latter option that's really on the table, that this is going to be this response is not going to be proportional, quote, unquote. It's going to be regime change. Okay, that's, you're saying the possibility of regime change. Casey Singh, do you want to respond to what you're just hearing from our American guests suggesting that Israel may well take a maximalist response towards Iran to try and cripple Iran economically, possibly target its oil installations as a retaliatory measure? Do you think that that is possible? Oh, well, I largely agree with that. That's true. That's what that's exactly what uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu said. Uh, it's been hinted so far. This is probably one of the options which was on the table. But the Prime Minister le left us in no doubt mm -hmm. because he said the people of Iran need to be liberated. But that would be a serious mistake because there's been a meeting in Doha where all the GCC countries have met. Foreign ministers of two countries, Qatar and Oman, have openly come out against Israel. As probably the UAE are the most frightened of Iran, and they are still sticking to the Abraham Accords. Saudis never joined the Abraham Accords, and their foreign minister also met very warmly the Iranian leader. And therefore, they are opting out of it. They are saying, we'll be neutral. You're not getting involved, because uh, Iranians have hinted that you take our oil facilities out, then we will go after the oil facilities of your allies. Uh, and Americans have also got... Uh, military bases in Qatar, in UAE, and so on and so forth. All those come on the table. Uh, at the very least, Iran can stop the export of oil by blocking the Strait of Hormuz. Mm -hmm. uh, they control the northern flank of that. And it's very easy to, they've done it during the Iran-Iraq war. They attempted it. But certainly they can reduce the amount of oil flowing through, even if they don't attack the oil facilities mm -hmm. of the Gulf countries. Mm -hmm. But one can see the a nervousness in the GCC countries, and that's why they've announced. Now, the question is, how does Israel attack? It has to overfly an Arab country. It has to refuel in the air. That leaves only Jordan out. Mm -hmm. Now, would Jordan be joining in in this? So there is a certain, don't forget, that there is also the Arab street. Autocratic Arab leaders may go along, may not like Israel, may go along with the Americans, may want... No, Iran I, to be pun are you punished. saying are you saying that if Israel takes a maximalist approach towards Iran by targeting their oil installations, the Arab street could well come out and force their regimes also, even the moderate regimes, to support Iran. Is that what you're suggesting? Not the Emirates. It can happen in Bahrain, it can happen in Jordan. Uh, and as I said, Qatar and Oman in any case have opted out. They've taken a very strong position against Israel. Mm -hmm. But large, even the Saudis will not want, because they have a large population base, uh, they, will, they will not join the Abraham Accords. Mm -hmm. So there will be a division. There won't be a unity in the GCC to sit out and let 
Israel do whatever they want vis-a-vis -vis Iran. I think that that is very clear. And okay. that is why there is. That's why the Americans will exert their most. But let me add one thing. The problem is President Biden. Not only is he lame duck, but he has a history of friendship with Netanyahu. Even when President Obama was there, as vice president, he was much warmer. Obama was pushing Netanyahu. Uh, he was forcing him, do not build more settlements. But uh, uh, Mr. Biden, even as uh, vice president, has an old equation with Prime Minister Netanyahu. From the time he was senator and Prime Minister Netanyahu was ambassador, Israeli ambassador to the UN. So there is that combined with being a lame duck, combined with a degree of, uh, you know, not being all there. Uh, so that is the unfortunate right. thing. And last me, point, yes. last point, right? The one last point. I think what Prime Minister Netanyahu wants is for Trump to be elected. He would like more chaos in the Gulf because that may well help Trump in the American election. Okay. That's very interestingly the way we'll put it. We'll, we'll get an Israeli response in a moment. But Lahib Higel is senior Iraq analyst at the International Crisis Group in Stockholm. I spoke to her earlier. Uh, Ms. Helim, uh, Israel hit a weapons depot in a Syrian town also this week. It has hit some sites in Damascus, reportedly killed an Iranian military advisor in the country. How do you see all these airstrikes now, not just uh, in Lebanon, but also on Syrian locations right after the killing of Nasrallah and the ground invasion of Lebanon? Are we seeing a possible expansion of the conflict into Syria as well? Well, um... Israeli strikes on uh, the axis of resistance in Syria and in Damascus are not new. Mm. In April, um, an Iranian general was killed in Damascus. So this is only an extension of this war that Israel has really been uh, waging, um, not just um, on Gaza since 7 of October, but in extension against the axis of resistance in the region. You know, many analysts by are pointing out how Iran showed restraint initially when the Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh was killed in Tehran in July. No retaliation then. Uh, probably the moderates in the regime prevailed then. But after Nasrallah's killing, the sense is Tehran has chosen to act or had no choice to act. Do you believe this is a war Iran wants to avoid or is now pushed into a position where it also has no option but to hit back? Well, Iran has been facing a, a crisis of uh, confidence and credibility among its partners um, since that assassination of Ismail Hani and, and Tehran. And that has only been aggravated as this conflict has developed, uh, where Israel has, um, to a large degree, undermined uh, Hezbollah through a series of operations that culminated in the killing of Hassan Nasrallah, who is a primary figure of of the regional axis and this came as a as a great shock and i don't remember having seen the degree of open criticism of um commentators that are affiliated with resistance actors uh whether in lebanon or in iraq as in the past few weeks mm -hmm. openly criticizing iran for its inaction so um for Tehran to to act in some way, I think was expected uh, at this point. I, I just want my guest to hold on for a moment because I just want to play an excerpt from an interview I did with the Iranian ambassador to India along with my colleague Geeta Mohan. Uh, Dr. Ilahi told me where Iran stands. Listen in carefully to the Iran perspective for a moment. If you say that there has been this bombing of the Palestinian people, of the destruction of Gaza. How is a missile strike of the kind that Iran has launched on Israel going to actually stop that? And it will only embolden Israel can even I, further can to, I target, uh, to, to target Iran, possibly to target other parts uh, 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 where Iranian so-called proxies are there. Can I just add there, is Iran prepared? Is Iran prepared for an attack by Israel? Because that's certainly something that's it's going to happen. It's a good question. You know, the question has two parts. The first part is that the relation between Iranian strike to Israel and uh, going, uh, ongoing massacre in Gaza. How is it going to stop it? You know, 
we uh, indirectly indirectly when israel is uh, is uh, engaged with itself inside israel it uh, it will and uh, we targeted military bases military installation of israel it has affected the cap military capability of this uh, illegal and illegitimate regime to uh, invade more or strike more um, gaza but the they denied, region. sir. Mr. Ambassador, they denied. They say your strikes have had yeah. no impact. If please, anything, please. in the last 48 hours, we've seen more Israeli strikes on Beirut, on Lebanon. So, and the Beirut airport. Today. And do you really believe, therefore, that Iran's missile strikes have actually in any way uh, compromised Israel's ability to attack uh, Gaza or Lebanon or indeed possibly Iran in the future? You know, you know, uh, the, me the media in the war, the, during the war, during the war or, you know, any tension, but every side tried to uh, underestimate the consequences or result of any operation. You know, we do the same, they have, but you, before the, before the start of the, our talk, you, in your channel, you show, you show that Iranian missile how heated the territory of uh, occupied Palestine and the explosion. So, you know, uh, you're listening to the uh, uh, Mr. Ishenkov. The Iranians claim that they have sent out a strong message to Israel with these ballistic missile strikes. Do you buy that? Do you believe Israel? Uh, uh, Iran is being underestimated when we suggest when Israel says, "Look, we'll go into." Just what you did in Gaza, what you did with the Hezbollah, can you do it actually in Iran? Or is that a huge risk that Israel would be taking if they chose to directly confront a country like Iran, which could be weeks away from being a nuclear power? Well, well first of all, let me um, address the point that uh, you, you asked before if, it's, if Iran wants to avoid war. Yes. Well, obviously, you know, supporting Hamas, supporting Hezbollah, supporting the Houthis and the multi-front war against what they can't even mention the name Israel. They always talk about the occupying Zionist regime, the so-called supreme leader. So I think we know exactly where Iran is. Second of all, the fact that Iran attacked Israel well, since April and over the last couple of days with something uh, in excess of 500 missiles, rockets and cruise missiles and drones, you know, it was not a show of strength. It was, a, it was a show of great weakness from the strategic point of view from the Iranian side. Mm -hmm. uh, there was no strategic damage in Israel and we were able to defend ourselves and intercept many of these rockets coming in. Mm -hmm. As opposed to that, uh, the Iranians do not have the same missile defense as Israel and they'd be very, uh, should be very cautious about when we say that we will be determined to reach out and to uh, attack threats to our national security, wherever they come from in the Middle East, we mean what we say. Mm -hmm. Now, we're not looking to escalate this into a regional war. I think we should consider our response carefully. It doesn't necessarily have to be just a military response. It could be uh, a response that incorporates uh, economic uh, sanctions, very serious sanctions, um, energy, uh, t uh, looking at the energy section, and also, first of all, not forgetting that Iran, as was said before, is maybe weeks away from being able to put together a nuclear weapon capability. And this is one of the things that Iran is very happy about the present situation because no one is talking, everyone is talking about Gaza, they're talking about Lebanon, they're talking here, there, but then no one is talking about the, Israeli, the Iranian nuclear program, which is a very you know, advanced program in terms of the levels of enrichment and also mm -hmm. possibly in terms of their weaponization of, uh, of uh, nuclear devices. So these are things that we have to take into no, account. But, but, but does, sir, if I may ask you more directly, does, yeah. as, and as some of our panelists have alluded to that, including the Israeli ambassador saying, it is Netanyahu who wants to prosecute this war because of his own internal issues, because he sees this as an opportunity in a way, perhaps, he needs to continue to prosecute the war. You've got Casey Singh suggesting that he knows the U.S. at the moment with a lame duck president will not stop him. There were even reports that there was a ceasefire that had been agreed upon. What does Israel do? Go and take out Hassan Nasrallah. So is Mr. Netanyahu determined to prosecute the war? He doesn't want any minimalist option of economic sanctions. He wants to go in. 
Look, I'm not a spokesman for the Netanyahu government, and I have uh, uh, my own views of how we should uh, pr prosecute this war. Um, and I don't think that this, um, you know, the, the need to defend Israeli national security is not just a personal political need for, ne for ne Mr. Netanyahu. Mm -hmm. It is also a national security imperative. Um, so I, uh, you know, how listen, would you prosecute the country, war? How would no you, you say you have a different view to prosecute? Well, let me you ask you, let, so let me ask you a question. How would India respond if you were attacked with 181 ballistic missiles? Mm -hmm. Would you say, well, this is a political thing. We can't, you know, respond to this. Israel, like every country in the world with national security problems, needs mm -hmm. to maintain its deterrence. We cannot afford to allow a country to attack us daily with hundreds of rockets from Lebanon, also from Hamas, mm -hmm. and also direct attacks against Israel. There has to be a very strong message sent to Iran. And I'm sure Indian national security experts would understand the very clear logic behind this. Interesting. Uh, 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 just let me also play what I asked this question to Sarah, uh, Sari Hanaf Hanafi, who is in Beirut, uh, on Iran. Iran, uh, Mr. Hanafi, this week firing nearly 200 missiles at Israel. Today, the Iranian Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei addressing Friday press, defending the missile attack. Uh, Khamenei also defending the October 7th Hamas massacre that Israel says triggered this whole war. But a year later... Do you believe that Israel wants to avoid war or Israel has willy-nilly dragged the Hezbollah and others into this war? Yes, I think all the world want to avoid this regional war, except Netanyahu for a personal reason and actually is a, is a fascist society and regime. Because if you look to the poll in Israel, is, uh, is, uh, is around 69% uh, of the Israelis in favor of invading Lebanon. So it's, a, it's a, exactly like in, in, in the time where you were uh, colonized by uh, British. Uh, go and, and make a poll uh, in UK. Uh, they would be very happy to stay in India. The same thing uh, about this fascist Israeli society. So, uh, so only this society wanted regional war. Neither Iran nor even United States want it. But of course, United States become so weak in front of this uh, bloody Israeli lobby inside of this uh, society and Netanyahu uh, 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 genocidal project for the region. Uh, you, uh, you know, let, let, let me get in more responses first from you there, uh, Andrew Latham. You're shaking your head listening to that. You know, these are the words we hear the Arab view is very clear, with, with sli slight variations perhaps in, the, in expression, but the fact is they see Israel as occupying Gaza. They believe, you tell them about October 7, they will take you back to 1947. They will then turn and say the United States and the United Nations have completely failed to stop the war. How do you see this therefore playing out? Is the United States simply no longer seen having any effective moral leadership or political leadership to be able to play any kind of role anymore. Before I get to that, let me just say that I wish I had never heard such nonsense in my life, but I hear it all the time on American campuses. Genocide, really? When Israel occupied those two territories in 1967, there were about 1.5 million Palestinians. Now there are 5.5 million Palestinians in those territories. If that's genocide, I'm sorry, but the Zionist entity is really bad at it. Second of all, we need to actually focus a little bit on, in this particular moment, who initiated this conflict? Hamas, a proxy of Iran, committed and bragged about war crimes, crimes against humanity that they perpetrated. Indiscriminately shelling and rocketing uh, northern Israel to the point where you display 60,000 people from their homes is a war crime under international law, period, end of story. Mm -hmm. The bigger picture here is about deterrence. Iran thought that through its proxies, its so-called uh, ring of fire, the uh, principally Hezbollah, but also Hamas, the Houthis, and its proxies in Syria and uh, Iraq, 
could um, threaten Israel so that if it ever did anything against Iran, they could unleash this ring of fire. Well, you know what? It t turns out to have been a damp squib, to use the very old-fashioned term. There's nothing there. Israel has destroyed Hamas as a military actor. It is in the process of dismantling Hezbollah as a military actor. The Houthis are reduced to firing one or two missiles periodically. The only deterrent that Iran still possesses, in principle, is its ballistic missiles, because its air force and its air defense system were cutting edge in 1979, but they don't amount to a hill of beans at the moment. They, the, the ballistic missile attack amounted to nothing. Again, Israel has a choice. It can respond in kind and, and blow up a few Iranian air bases, which it could do with absolute impunity. Mm -hmm. There's no way the Iranians could stop them. Or it could take it to the next level of escalation dominance and strip Iran, the Tehran regime, mm -hmm. of its ability to fund these groups by simply shutting down the only two ports they have through which they export their oil most of which illegally. If the EU and the United States and others really begin uh, to impose, to enforce the sanctions that are already in place, Iran as a state might well, th th sorry, this particular regime, this mm -hmm. Islamist regime might well collapse. That's what Be Benjamin Netanyahu is hoping for. I think that's what a lot of Republicans in the United States are hoping for. And I'm pretty sure there's a lot of Israelis are really hoping for that. That's where we are. KC Singh, do you therefore see this at all happening? That is what Kamini said today, bravado of a leader who finds the Hezbollah, which they have sponsored, losing their leadership, finds Hamas destroyed, finds the Houthis possibly also under pressure. So could you, could we envisage a possible situ scenario where this is Iran's last stand as, or this regime's last stand in a way? Uh, Rajib, I don't think the uh, Iranian regime is going to collapse that fast. Uh, Iranians have a tendency, it's an old civilization, two and a half thousand year old uh, continuous gov governance there. So they will rally behind the government if, it, if there is an attack from outside. Mm -hmm. uh, they will put it because after all, the sanctions have been there for a long time. The sanctions were supposed to act in the last seven, eight years, nine years. And in parallel, Iran, it has not ha happened. Uh, people have put up with a lot of distress, economic distress. But there is also a porous exchange mm -hmm. between, say, Dubai and places in the Gulf, uh, which help Iran out. No, so are you saying so, a regime change is ruled out? Are you saying that irrespective of what happens next, a regime change in Iran is ruled out? Look, it's not going to be that simple that you bomb their things out and after that the people rise up, people have risen up in the past. Uh, and that then, the re because a regime is not just a civilian regime, it's got a clerical base, it's got a military base, IRGC. Uh, it's very intertwined, it goes down to the village level. Mm -hmm. So it's not an isolated Shah of Iran mm -hmm. sitting in Tehran, whom you can take out with some demonstrations in Tehran or change just the leader at the top. Mm -hmm. It saturates the entire thing. It's a combination of religion mm -hmm. combined with their history, their past. Mm -hmm. And that comes in. The minute you attack them, mm -hmm. they'll all come together. Mm -hmm. The people will be willing to sacrifice. They will all come together and they'll find a way out of it. And okay. remember, the Chinese are absolutely silent. The Chinese defended the April missile attack of Iran on Israel. Don't forget that. There is an overland connection through Central Asia to China and to Russia. The Russians are also watching. There's the Caspian Sea through which the Russians and the Chinese would help them. So oh. therefore, it will become a big bipolar new kind of Cold War in which Iran will be up front. But the regime is not about to collapse, okay. not so quickly. Let me let, let me bring in for a moment Lahib Higel, who I also spoke to earlier, because as, as we are hearing... Most of the experts seem to suggest there will be an escalation now before any de-escalation happens. An Israeli counter-strike in whatever form is inevitable. What, according to you, could be the targets for possible Israeli airstrikes? 
Well, I mean, that still remains to be seen. Um, I, I think uh, the more extreme uh, side of, of um, the Israeli decision makers would, would want to strike big going for uh, nuclear facilities, mm -hmm. uh, oil installations or, or the like. Uh, we might see something less than that uh, uh, based on uh, what the U.S., I think, are trying to convince the Israelis to respond proportionately, considering what the Iranian strike looked like. Um, and depending on the scope of, uh, of the Israeli response, Iran might, again, uh, have to retaliate in, in kind. So um, you're right. There might be some more escalation before we see the escalation. And where, according to you, does the United States stand in all, this, all of this? There was a proposal for a 21-day ceasefire, apparently, that was being worked out uh, in, in America with the United Nations on board. The very next day, Nasrallah was killed. Do you believe the U.S. has little choice right now but simply ride the storm, whatever Netanyahu does, till the elections get over? Well... The U.S. seems to have been walking into um, Israel's traps uh, over and over uh, throughout this conflict and has now really put itself in a position uh, where it uh, needs to support in Israel in its very reckless in endeavors um, across the region and might be dragged in itself. But I think that um, the U.S. has also realized this. Um, they are therefore trying to, to convince the Israelis uh, to respond in a way that this doesn't uh, drag in the U.S. too much, especially considering that the elections are coming up and that might um, have an impact on, on the outcome of the elections. Mr. Ishikov, is, is there any ceasefire possibility? Let's talk finally about, as we end the end of the show, on end games. Is there any end game that you see within the next month that could actually bring down hostilities? Do you at all see de-escalation possible? Or are you convinced that it will now, we will go up an escalatory spiral before anyone even now talks of a ceasefire? Is Netanyahu on this path of escalation? Uh, you, your audio, sir. Uh, Jeremy, your audio. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I think uh, we obviously, uh, as I said before, have to look at our options in a very cool and collected manner. Mm -hmm. um, I personally am in favor of uh, seeking a ceasefire in the south, in Gaza, and getting our hostages out for us, for Israelis. Uh, this is, a, you know, one of the highest priorities. Um, and I think that that could also have a calming effect on the, on the north. And I've got so to say... If, so that, just to stop you there, if Hamas tomorrow were to, get, uh, were to release the hostages, would that be a major step towards uh, a, yeah. a ceasefire and de-escalation? It would be a big cease... It would be a very major factor in stopping the war in Gaza. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, I think that could have an impact on the fighting in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. However... Mm -hmm. There is still the major problem of Iran. And one thing I have to say, Mr. Hanafi used every swear word he could in relation to my country and calling Israel a fascist society mm -hmm. uh, is, is really offensive. And I think that Lebanon should look at itself and you should look at yourself, Mr. Hanafi, in terms of you allowing and watching your own country fall uh, to the hands of terrorists and being run by terrorists mm -hmm. and avoiding all the Lebanese sovereignty possible in that country. But leaving that aside, also Iran... Uh, uh, has, has attacked Israel. As I said, there needs to be a response to that, and that response is not just military. It can be involving a number of diplomatic moves. And at the end of the day, uh, at the end of the day, wars generally result in political settlements. And I think that we should all be thinking very carefully of what the end game is and how we can find the points of convergence in order to bring this war that I don't think any serious, stable-minded and responsible uh, people in this country, in this region, want the, the, the war to continue and to escalate. I, I just want to, of course, remind our viewers, I spoke to Mr. Hanafi earlier, which is why he cannot directly respond. Uh, but uh, Mr. Hanafi, I asked him this in Beirut as well. Do you see an endgame at all? 
Do you see any solution in the near future at a time when your country is being bombed day in and out? Well, I think I think this is a very difficult question. We have different scenarios. We have a scenarios where uh, uh, Hezbollah will be able to uh, to resist well and uh, force Israel to to have a ceasefire with Lebanon, uh, uh, and and then uh, we uh, we can have a hope that uh, university will resume in the West, and it will be uh, a lot of demonstration against this genocidal war on Gaza. So this is one scenario. The second scenario is really is going to regional war. And in this regional war, it's a lose-lose situation. Mm -hmm. uh, Israel will be destroyed, uh, its in infrastructure. Iran will, uh, will have the same thing. Iran will strike in the Gulf uh, the, uh, against the American interests in the, in the Gulfian countries. So, and then, uh, uh, the the Western uh, uh, power, uh, this neoliberal, will uh, finally feel that it will cost them uh, that uh, they will not sell uh, much uh, uh, in in this count in this region. They will realize that the uh, the oil price will go uh, so up that uh, will undermine their economy, and then they will make pressure against the fascist Netanyahu. Uh, let me ask that question to uh, which I asked to Lahib Hegel as well. Do you see uh, what is the end game? Do you see any other powers with interest in the region, Russia, China getting involved in the conflict? Or do you believe this conflict will be limited to West Asia? Yeah, it, it doesn't look like it uh, for the moment. I, I think that the the Russians and the Chinese are are probably quite content looking at um, how this is uh, tying down the U.S. once again uh, in the Middle East and uh, not really giving it space to think about um, you know the more strategic uh, competition uh, with the larger powers. But um, of course, I mean Russia to some degree is is. Um, supporting the Axis actors, in particular Iran. There might be deliveries uh, that upgrade Iran's defensive systems, but I don't think that it would really go beyond that at this point. But of course, it all matters how long this uh, conflict actually continues. A Andrew Latham, what do you see as, uh, how do you see this, what, what is the end game? Well, I think if um, the uh, political forces represented, and he's just the tip of a very big iceberg by Netanyahu and certain Republicans, I think the end game is going to be a little more uh, dramatic than some of the people around the table uh, think. I think it's going to be about uh, fracturing a regime which is already pretty fragile. And I think that group is going to win out, not attacking nuclear facilities, but attacking the oil infrastructure, which will bankrupt, mm -hmm. which will bankrupt Iran, and therefore will bankrupt Iran's proxies in the region, um, I have no doubt about that. W what the ultimate end game is is, you know, history is a very fickle thing. Um, my sense is that the perfectly legitimate, as authorized by the United Nations in 1948, the perfectly legitimate state of Israel will be around for a long time. Okay. The state I of Iran will be around for a long time. But it might not be ruled by the people who rule it currently. And I, th I think that um, medium to long term, we're going to see an alliance of Israel, the United States, Jordan, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, the Gulf Cooperation Council states. And they're all going to come together to form some kind of natural balance of power against this regime in Iran until that regime goes away. Okay, I just have 20 seconds, uh, Casey Singh. Are we therefore going to see a redrawn map of the Middle East, perhaps six to 12 months down the line? Is that a real possibility now? Very quickly. Not at all, right? Deep, you've seen that is what IMEC was. That's what Americans were trying. Just one uprising of the Hamas has undone that. I think you need, if there's a regime change you want in Tehran, there is one required also in Jerusalem. Netanyahu is hanging on to power. In July, when he addressed the U.S. Congress, two-thirds of Israelis wanted him out. Uh, Kamala Harris didn't attend his lecture. 
half the Democrats were not there. So he's created divisions in America also. So the pressure would be coming more from Kamala Harris than from Biden himself. Because she realizes that this spins out of control, she will pay the price for it because she lose the election. And I think that is the debate which will be taking place there. Okay. Ultimately, you're not going to have peace until Netanyahu goes because he wants to become popular. He wants to show a victory. He wants to get over his failure of not having handled Hamas properly, of having just sat there and allowed them to uh, break out of the stronghold. And to get over that, he's doing all this and showing all this success. And yeah. also the Israeli intelligence is doing it because they needed some success. But Iran is not going down that fast. Let I've me... served there. This is, a, this is a regime which is not going to just topple over because Netanyahu blows at them. Okay, let me leave it there. I think we've heard, we've had a wonderful round table where we've heard eminently articulate voices. And I think the important aspect that's coming through is the need perhaps to find some way to perhaps have such conversations at different levels that can cut across the noise and hopefully find solutions. The last thing the world needs is another escalating conflict that eventually results in, the, in thousands of civilians dying even as the actors play out their war games. I appreciate all my guests joining us here on the West Asia Roundtable. Thank you all very much for joining me. Bye for now. Namaskar.